Good morning. It's good to be with you. Uh, some of you, I, you guys, I assume that a lot of you have been to Verge, so you already know a bit who I am, right? So I don't know if I need to tell you that much, but I'll tell you a little bit. Uh, I want to pray first, and then we're going to dive in together. Uh, and I just want to let you know, I, I consider it such a privilege to get to be here and train and just pour into you, and I hope that the Spirit works in your hearts, that you're open to that, and that Jesus is magnified. Um, I think there's such great stuff going on here in your church and in the city, and so it's just humbling to get to be a part of that. It really is. So let's just go together uh, in prayer and ask for our help. Father, we come to you and we are grateful that we have the privilege of learning together today, not just from a human, but from the Spirit of God speaking to our hearts. And we thank you that, as your word tells us, the Spirit knows the mind of God and knows the hidden thoughts and can impart wisdom. And uh, God, your very mind and heart to us. And that's what we want. We don't want just human understanding or concepts. We want your very heart, Father. We want the mind of Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, would you make that happen today? We know that's your job, and you do it well. So we ask that you would enable us to submit to the work that you want to do. And uh, let nothing get in the way today. Not our flesh, not the world, not the devil, not the worries of life. We pray nothing would choke out the seed of the gospel as you planted in us, Holy Spirit. We pray it would bear much fruit and that Christ would receive the glory that's due his name and that this city would experience the, the joy of the Lord and the joy of our salvation. We ask that we would even experience that today and we pray that that would happen and we trust it will so we thank you ahead of time for the good work you will do in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'll, I'll start with just a little bit about who I am, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive in. I won't tell too much of my story, but it is important, uh, and, and you're going to hear this throughout the day. It's important to understand the story of the people you're ministering to. It's important for you to understand your own story in order for you to even understand how you perceive and understand and hear things, because... We all receive things through what we've already received. So the, the lens of your mind and your heart uh, are already tainted, cracked, distorted, or maybe even pu getting purified and, re and remade in light of what's happened throughout your entire life. And so uh, even today as we go through teaching, it's important for you to recognize that so much of your learning is coming through the lens of your experience. And uh, that's, that's part of the work of, of being reformed, being redeemed, being changed, is, is your story is getting redeemed and you're being changed from day to day, from glory to glory. And so my, my background is that I grew up in the church, had some wonderful parents, still married, thankfully. Um, I have three brothers. I'm the second of four. Uh, my older brother wasn't as much of a uh, upfront leader, uh, so I was a bit of a frustrated second child, I think, looking back. Didn't know it then, but because uh, I'm a bit of a pioneer and risk taker and love to push out into the ends of the earth kind of limit. And uh, I grew up in that home, grew up in a fairly, uh, I'd say, a, a good church that probably didn't have gospel centered teaching in it. I don't know that there were a lot of churches from my r memory that really knew how to preach the gospel into all of life. And so, so much of my background was the Bible says it, that's good enough for me kind of thing, and, and very black and white, somewhat legalistic, moralistic background. And I rebelled against that. Uh, I just kept seeing that that didn't seem to be what I saw when I read the scriptures. I can't say that I was following Jesus with all my heart until I was 21 when he grabbed a hold of me and awakened me and put me to my knees and said, I want you to give me everything. I... I remember as a little boy, I'd prayed a, kind of prayed that prayer that in evangelical circles that we were told to pray, and, and yet you just have a hard time finding that particular prayer in the scriptures. It's interesting. Um, and so I, I kind of, you know, wrote the date in my Bible and the whole deal. And it's like, you know, okay, it was on that day that you became a Christian. And, and I put so much of my confidence in a prayer I prayed instead of the Jesus that 
died for me on the cross and rose again on the third day. And unfortunately, my confidence was in religion and not in Jesus. And um, I really was more concerned about my eternal destiny after I died than I was the present reality of the eternity breaking into this world right now. And so, so much of my life was, this is all about me, but one day when I die, because I sinned, at least Jesus died for my sins, and I'm not going to hell. That was pretty much Christianity for me. And when I was 21, Jesus uh, visited me very clearly, not in vis visible form like, like some have gotten experience, but uh, I couldn't ignore it. He was there in the room with me in Spain. I was going to school there. And uh, he said, you gave me your afterlife. You never gave me your life. I want your life. And in that moment, I, I surrendered my life to him and said, I'll do anything you want. And I was originally going to school for business, and then I was going to go to law school. And uh, he completely turned that around. I still finished with a business degree. I'm kind of an anomaly as a pastor because I never, ever went to Bible school and never, ever wanted to be a pastor, never wanted to do full-time ministry. My older brother wanted to, and I thought that's what you do if you want to sit in an office and read books all the time and not be with people and not do anything adventurous. So who would want to do that, you know? And so that was kind of, I rebelled against it, and then God called me into it and started in youth ministry and did that for 14 years before God called me into church planting of which I've been doing for about 10 years now. And uh, in the middle of my work in planting Soma, probably not the middle, I'd say probably year two or three, uh, God really uh, gave me another kind of wake-up call in that we had been calling the church to be on mission in everyday life. We had been calling the church to uh, radically reorient their lives around the mission of Jesus. And I think that's right and it's good. And we had taught through what does it mean to be incarnational and uh, intentional and how to form missional communities and I mean we had done all, we figured out all the practice but people were getting burned out people were getting weary and at one point we realized we had been motivating them and empowering them with something other than the gospel uh, good inspiration and look at the world out there they're in need and if they, we don't do it who will that kind of you know like tug at the heart emotionalism that people do respond to but it will not ever give them the strength, the power to do supernatural ministry because it's not supernatural. It's natural. You know, you can appeal to the emotions all you want. You can appeal to the guilt and shame all you want. And it does work, but it doesn't last. And it will destroy. It'll burn you out. It will, it will just make you weary and, and overwhelmed. And you'll feel like you're carrying the burden of the world on your shoulders instead of trusting that Jesus carries it on his shoulders. And, and in, the, in the end, then you don't have any good news because you're not, you don't have anything different than what the world has. And so God showed us that. And by his grace, I was introduced to people like Tim Keller and Ed Clowney and a bunch of other really great gospel-centered people and Tim Chester and Steve Timmis and, and just a lot of people that really spoke into our lives from afar and then, of course, we, by God's grace, got to get closer and became friends with some of them. And, and it began to shift and change how we do church, how we live as the body of Christ, at least in Soma. And uh, God has given me, by his grace, the ability to take really super smart people stuff and try to make it much more accessible. Uh, so hopefully uh, I can do that today. That's really what we're going to talk about, is how do we look at the gospel for all of life? And uh, I, like I already said, the people I just referenced are super smart, way smarter than I am, and God's just given me the grace to try to be a regular guy, hopefully, who gets to bring it to our level, and hopefully I help you with that today. So that's what we're going to do, and I'll just tell you, I'm deeply motivated by it, because were it not for the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's, I wouldn't have a church, I wouldn't have a life, I wouldn't have anything. So, so it's coming out of the overflow of my heart, it's not just, it's not just stuff I like to teach. It's, uh, it's my life. It's what I, I believe sustains us. I believe it's what will keep us to the end. It's our hope. And so I hope that you'll be caught up with great affection today in Christ Jesus and all that he's done for us. That's my hope. So what I want to do is I want to start by turning to Ephesians 4 with you. I understand that at least the men, I think, were exhorted by Kevin this last week in the, from this passage I, I, just so you know, a little side note, it feels like I walked way back into the past, you know, like where you had those churches where the men sit on, sit on the right side and the women sit on the left side, and like, and now it's the men are in the front and the women are in the back, and I know it's because you're on cohort tables, but 
It's kind of funny. I think it's because the women are super smart, and the guys need to get close because they'll like drift all day long. So <laughs> they just know like they need extra help today. So Ephesians 4. I want to start in verse 11. And he gave, and this is referring to Jesus giving gifts to the church. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So I think you already know this. I think you, you guys hear it a lot at your church, but I want to say it again. Uh, there aren't a few who God has given to the church to do ministry for the many. many. There, are, there are some that God has given to the church to equip the many for ministry. And the idea is that the body of Christ does the ministry. It's not as though there are paid ministers and the rest are just attenders and members. It's that everybody who's a member of the body of Christ is a minister. We're all called to be equipped for ministry. So that's what he's saying here. Until we obtain to the, no the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And remember that phrase right there. Uh, the equation of attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And that's right in the middle of this. So knowledge of the Son of God is really important. Uh, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's this unity of faith around what? The knowledge of the Son of God. And that's, it's on that that we begin to grow up into maturity. And you'll see a little bit more about that as we keep going. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So he's saying maturity looks like you're, you're at a place where you're not easily fooled. You're not easily torn away from the truths that you first came to, that you can discern truth from error. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, just as a side note, when I talk to churches about missional communities and actually entrusting into the hands of the body of Christ the ministry of the gospel, many pastors will say, well, how can you do that? Aren't you afraid there's going to be heresy or that they're going to go off and they raise really crazy stuff. And I'm like, man, if we want to get honest, the people who are bringing us into crazy heretical stuff is the pastors and the theologians. It's not the members of the body of Christ right now. Like, that's, that's, I'm more concerned about the people who have authority and power to say this is the truth, thus saith the Lord, than I am about the people who are tending to listen to them. And, and it's like, but here it's saying, if people actually grow up in maturity, you can trust that they're not going to walk away. If they grow up in the maturity in Christ, we don't have to worry about it. Because they're not going to be easily tossed to and fro. And the reality is, the reason why probably we're fearful of it is, we aren't growing people up in maturity. So we're afraid they're going to be easily misled. And that's a problem in the church. As Paul says to the Colossian church, it's my job, as he says, to present everyone complete and mature in Christ. Uh, the, the idea that we would have perpetual immaturity in the church is a, just a, it's a crazy idea. The Apostle Paul were around, he'd say... Well, what in the world were you thinking? Didn't you know it was your job to help everybody grow up? Not just to have a church full of orphans that need one or two people to tell them what to believe and think every single week. Like, the church should grow up into maturity. If you've been a Christian for several years and you're still not mature, then we need to ask, what happened? What, did we lose sight of the intention that God had for his people? And that is to grow up into Christ. And that's part of what he's saying here. So that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro. 15, rather... So now he's saying this is how it works. Instead of, being, instead of being tossed to and fro, instead of being deceived, we are speaking the truth in love. And by doing that, we are to grow up in every way into him who's the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And what he's saying there is that we speak the truth in love to one another, and by doing so, we grow each other up into maturity, and as we're growing up in maturity, we each learn how to speak the truth in love to one another, and so now we're all building each other up in maturity. In some ways, we're creating like a, a greenhouse or a, a petri dish of, of a maturity that you can't get away from somebody who's going to build you up into Christ. Now, the question that you probably should ask when you read this is, what is speaking the truth in love, because he's saying that's the, the way, that's the means by which we grow up. And for many of us, speaking the truth in love has become kind of like a tagline for hard words, right? You know, like, 
hey, brother, you know, like you don't have much fashion sense, but just love you, so I'm speaking the truth in love, you know. You, I'm not, you know, you look all right, but. <laughs> or, you know, like, do you, you understand that people, you kind of drive people nuts in our missional community because you're always, like, hogging the conversation, and so I just want to talk to you about that, and just, you know, because I speak the truth in love, man, that's what we do as a church. And we use this phrase thinking that we mean what it means, but that's not what it means. That's just Christian apologetics for being jerks. You know, usually. You know, you know I, just, I love you, bro. I got to just say it like it is. You, 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 know, you, got, you got stuff in your teeth. You know, that's, it's that we think that's speaking the truth in love. And if we do that, that'll build each other up. And that's not what he's talking about. In fact, in this particular passage, there's no sin to be confronted. There's not, there's not a problem he's addressing as though there's something wrong with the people. He's saying there's something that you speak to people that grows them up into maturity in Jesus Christ. So we should, just like all good uh, Bible study work, we should ask, what does the truth mean here? And I want to encourage you, don't ever put onto a text what you think it means. Ask the text what it means, because it usually tells you. So you, and the way that you find out what something means in the text is you keep reading. And if you don't find it within the text that you're reading, then you go to more text. But you keep reading until you find out what the Bible says it means instead of what a bunch of other people say it means. So always let your Bible interpret itself instead of you interpret it without the Bible. And uh, that's just a good principle in all of your Bible study. Now, let's keep reading. Now this I say and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And that's his way of saying those are the people who are tossed to and fro. They're Gentiles. They're futile thinkers. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not the way that you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, the answer of what the truth is was just given. What's the truth? You see it? Verse 21. You were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So what Paul is saying is, speaking the truth in love is speaking the truths of Jesus in love to one another. Another way to say this is speaking the gospel, because gospel is the word for good news, and we as Christians believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, and all that he is and has done and is doing. And so what he's saying is, you want to grow someone up into maturity, into Christ, you don't grow someone up into Christ unless you speak Christ to someone. So I think what's happened oftentimes in the church is we think, no, we speak the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ for someone's regeneration so they would come to faith, regenerate, converted, that they would experience, they would understand justification by faith alone and Christ alone, uh, by grace alone. And so we, we go, yeah, that's, we got that. And now let's give them something else to grow them up. So they, now they got Jesus and now let's teach them to study their Bible or pray or go to church or give or all these other good things. And I'm not saying they're bad, but we think those things will grow people up into Christ. But those things don't grow people up into Christ. In fact, potentially they could grow people away from Christ if they don't get Christ through those things. In other words, if you give someone a Bible study and they don't know how to get to Jesus in the Bible, they might actually like the Bible more than Jesus. You might give someone biblical pra- or good spiritual disciplines, prayer, and uh, fasting, and solitude, and you know we call it a quiet time, which it shouldn't be very quiet because you're hopefully meeting with God, and He tends to speak to people if they want, you know. So, uh, but we do that, and we say it's the practices that will grow you up into Christ. And I would, I just want to tell you that's wrong. It's wrong thinking. The only thing that will grow you up into Christ is Christ, Jesus. 
And if you don't get Jesus in your disciplines, then you're like the Pharisees who diligently search the scriptures thinking that by them they would have life, and yet they failed to come to Christ, as Jesus says. And so it's like they believed the Bible would give them life, not Jesus would give them life. And Jesus says, all this, all the scriptures were always pointing to me. You're not coming to me. You missed the whole point. The point of your Bible is not that you would know good truths. It was that you would know the truth. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And so the goal of all of our life is to get Jesus, to lead people to Jesus, to get them to know Jesus. The, the goal of our prayer time is that the Spirit would reveal the truths of God through Jesus Christ to our hearts and that we would pray to God through Jesus to the Father and that we would love Jesus when we pray and we would cling to Jesus when we pray and we would have a hope that God would reveal more of Jesus to us as we pray. And then as we pray, we would ask things according to his name. And as Jesus said, if you ask anything according to my name in John 14, that will I do. It's interesting. He doesn't say, if you ask anything according to my name, that will I answer. God isn't, isn't concerned that we just ask for prayer requests. It's that we ask for Jesus to work. It's that, that which you ask in my name, that I will do, he says. And what he's saying is, I want you to ask for stuff that will require me to show up in your life by my spirit and work. That's what I'm after. And it's interesting that it's John 15 that follows that little teaching from Jesus where he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in you and you'll bear much fruit. And what is he saying? He's saying your prayer life is about getting Jesus to live his life through you. It's not just to go to God through Jesus. It's to have God send Jesus to you. It's to have the Spirit make Jesus known to your hearts. It's to empower you to live a new life. It's not just prayer requests we send off to a, a distant deity. It's a God who dwells in us and works through us. That's the good news of the gospel. This isn't about you anymore. And so I want to encourage you, be very careful as you both are growing up in your faith, but you're helping others to grow up in your faith, to work hard to make Jesus the, the hope, the, the answer, the, the solution, the power, the, the means, the, the everything. In fact, what it means to be a Christian is you don't have anything about, about that, that's worthy or helpful or powerful other than Jesus Christ. There's a song I, I love that came out of Sovereign Grace. It's called, the title is All I Have in Christ. And it, as the guy goes through, as the, the lyrics continue, and I, I, w I don't have it in front of me, but the, the, the general theme is, I wouldn't even love if you hadn't loved me. If it weren't for you, I couldn't do a thing. There's nothing that I do, nothing that I have, nothing that I think, nothing that, that comes out of me that's good unless it was Jesus. And that's all I've got to boast in is Jesus Christ. And so my hope is today as we go through this, you'll affirm that. And you'll want to grow And how do you speak that. And I'm just going to tell you the tendency for us, all of us, is to drift away from Jesus to something else. And I think the reason why is because you can't control Jesus, but you can control lots of other things. You know? And so the idea that he would be in control is, is a, a threatening thing to our flesh, but it's the best thing for your flesh, that he would take control. So here's another thing I want to just put out there before we go any further. Um, there's also a bit of a problem, I think, in our thinking, in that many of us have kind of gotten to this idea that Evangelism is pre-conversion, and discipleship is post-conversion. So we have this idea that evangelism is what you do with unbelievers. Um, and when I say unbelievers, I mean unregenerate unbelievers, because the reality, if we're going to be honest, is that every one of you is an unbeliever in this room, because you still have lots of unbelief in the truths of Jesus in your life. Uh, I do too. That's what sanctification is. It's moving from unbelief to belief in absolutely every area of my life in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we tend to have this division that I think is a faulty division uh, because the scriptures actually don't make this kind of division. Um, we do. I don't know if it's our curriculum that did it. So we like had to have titles for the kinds of books we read, and that's, that's evangelism and that's discipleship. Or if it's the way that we, we felt like we could order people who's in, who's out, 
or you know, what's he actually do to those who are in and who ends out? But it's, it's a wrong dichotomy because the reality is, and you can even see this in the life of Jesus, Jesus calls disciples who don't believe. So he's doing discipleship pre-conversion by saying, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And we even know that some still didn't believe even after they saw him rise from the dead and they were still struggling. So there's this reality that they needed to have the good news preached to them over and over and over again. And so they needed the gospel preached. And evangelism, just so it's clear, comes from the root evangel. Evangel is the good news teller. It's the proclaimer of good news. That's what an evangel is. They're proclaiming good news. Evangelism is to proclaim good news. It's, it's to do the work of proclaiming the good news. And the, the reality is, is for someone to come to faith in Jesus, you have to do evangelism. And so in order to become a disciple, someone has to do evangelism. Someone has to proclaim the good news of Jesus for them to become a disciple of Jesus. But don't miss this. In order for people to grow up into Christ, you have to keep doing evangelism. In other words, you have to keep proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to all of life. Because discipleship, in terms of growing up into Christ-likeness, into growing up into Christ who's head, is accomplished through you speaking the truth in love, which is you speaking the gospel in love, which is doing evangelism. Okay? So hopefully today I'm going to do evangelism to you. I'm going to evangelize you. And you're going to go, no, we don't need it. We're Christians. You need it. I promise you, you need it. In fact, you need it every day of your life. You need it every moment of your life. You need the gospel preached to you over and over and over and over again. And if someone ever comes to you and proclaims another message other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, let him be damned, as Paul says. You know, let, let that be accursed. Let it be called anathema. Paul says to the Galatians, you've been bewitched. You've been so easily led astray. What happened? What, I gave you the gospel, and now you're diverting from the gospel and putting your hope in circumcision, putting your hope in the flesh, putting your hope in your, your good works. Don't be fooled. Don't be bewitched, he says to the Galatians. And same is true for us. And you might recall Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. There's going to come a day when that's not going to be popular, Paul says. People are going to want you to say what their itching ears want to hear. And Paul says, don't, don't, don't give in to that. Preach the word, in season, out of season. And a lot of us think <coughs> what Paul is saying is someone should be up on front on Sunday preaching. Somebody better preach every Sunday. I, I'm for that. Don't get me wrong. That's not what he's saying, though. Because then he goes on to say, do the work of an evangelist. So what is he saying? The word preach is, is the word basically that we should understand when we read the context of Scripture is the one who proclaims the gospel, the good news. That's what a preacher is in the New Testament. It's the one who proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not someone who just exegetes the scriptures. That's good, that's teaching. And if we preach Christ in it, it's preaching, according to Paul, as he instructs Timothy to preach the word in season and out of season, do the work of an evangelist. What he's saying is, you've got to keep proclaiming Christ, Timothy. You've got to keep proclaiming the gospel. That's what they need to hear. They can't, you give them something else, you're just giving what their itching ears want to hear because everybody wants to have another God. Everybody wants to fashion something in their own image. Everybody is going to drift away from the gospel of grace and you can't drift. Keep giving them Jesus Christ, Timothy. And so that's Paul's admonition as well. And what he's really saying is, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist and he's talking to what Timothy is going to do in Ephesus to a bunch of believers. Don't miss that. He's saying, keep being an evangelist to the church, Timothy. Yes, we're going to have to do it with, un with those outside who don't yet believe. But we've got to keep doing it with one another. Because it's the only way we're going to grow up. And that's what Paul is saying in his letter here as addressed to the Ephesians. Preach Jesus. Speak the truth in love. And in that way, we'll all grow up into Christ who is our head. Good? You got that? Are you convinced that we should do this? Okay. I, the, the, the task before us is, how do we do that? Okay, that's what we're going to spend the bulk of today on. But here's the thing. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just urging you, exhorting you. Be resolved in this. Be committed to let nothing else become good news to you other than Jesus Christ. Be resolved to not 
give people a substitute. Uh, the tendency will be, for example, someone will come and they'll be struggling with their finances. And how many of you are group leaders here? Some of you are group leaders. Some of you will be missional community leaders eventually. And um, some, maybe someone's going to come to you and they're going to be struggling with finances or debt or whatever. And the tendency will be go, to go, well, let's just take out Dave Ramsey and we'll go through that and help you get free of your debt and you know, come up with a good financial plan. And, and I'm not against that. I think there's some good principles there, so don't hear me wrongly. But don't start there. There's probably debt because they actually believed that material would give them great satisfaction, and it didn't, so they went after more of it to the point of getting into great debt, and it didn't satisfy. And so the problem is a worship problem. The problem is a gospel problem. The problem is that they don't cherish and love Christ above all else, and they've been looking elsewhere to find what only Christ can give them. And if we don't go to that first, then they won't get the fundamental problem dealt with that will help them. And then let's go even further. Let's not just give them... Christ for their worship, but let's let them know that Christ is a better way to understand how we ought to deal with our finances because he who is rich became poor so that in his poverty we might become rich. And we start to give them Jesus even for their counsel. We start to teach about giving in accordance with the gospel of Jesus Christ who gave his very self for us. And you begin to teach the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ into their financial struggles, not just hey, let me give you some other principles that probably are good and helpful, but are not enough. And we could get to those principles as we establish the foundation of Christ, but make sure you establish that. Another one might be, you know, someone comes to you and they're like, you're talking to them about purity, and, you know, you go, you know, like, I've heard it said so many times, like, you know, man, you should just wait until, you have, until you're married to have sex. And, you, and I've heard so many people do this, because then you'll have better sex. And you just want to go like, are you Christian? Because that's not, that's not Christian. That's not Christ-centered at all. That's flesh-centered. That's me-centered. That's Guess what? If you do this, you'll have a better life. So the primary motivation is you and your selfish desires. It, and I'll tell you one thing. That isn't going to give you great sex. If you're married here, if you want to have great sex, and that's the reason why you have sex, you'll have bad sex. And some of you are not married here, so, like, where, where do we learn about sex? Jesus Christ. You go, that's weird. He didn't have sex. What's going on, you know? <laughs> he created it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it was through the Word that all things came into existence. And so the very idea of sex is his idea in the first place. And if you want to know anything about how it works, you look at one who lays down his life for his bride and dies on a cross to purchase him, her for himself, and, and is sacrificial in his giving, so that he might have a bride, and then he's still waiting thousands of years. It's been over 2,000 years. He hasn't even consummated the marriage yet. He purchased her. He bled for her. He died for her. He laid down his life for her. And you want to talk about foreplay? 2,000 years of foreplay. <laughs> okay, men, learn something here. Right? You want to know about it? Look to Jesus. And you go like, that's ridiculous. No, it's the gospel, man. If people get the gospel, not only did it happen, if you know Jesus right now, you had a little worship moment. And you're going, how did we worship Jesus in the middle of a conversation about sex? Because you all went, he's amazing. And your hearts were warmed with affection for the one who would love you like that. Even though you're unfaithful, even though you're, you're not a pure bride, even though you've not saved yourself for him because you give yourself away day in and day out to others, and he has not. He's been faithful, waiting for you and me. And you go, wow, that's, that's what God's intent was. And then when you read Hosea and Gomer and you read that story and you realize that was really talking about Jesus and it makes a lot more sense, and you go, okay, that's what beautiful sex looks like. And, and then you, you stop talking about waiting and saving and and, and, and the, uh, the rewards that you'll get if you do it, and you start talking about Jesus, and then you're motivated from a different place, and you, you actually are going to get power, actually, to, to say no, because you, you ask Jesus to be the one who enables you to be the one who says no, and you say, Jesus, would you, like you did with the church, would you do that now in me, through me, so that I can treat women that way and honor them, or vice versa, men that way? And so that, this is what I'm after today. I want you to be able to, to take any 
issue or topic or concern, and if the, what is the question? Jesus is the answer. What is the problem? Jesus is the solution. What is the, 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 the depression? Jesus is the hope. Like, that's where I want us to go today. I want you to become so versed, and I know you won't in one day, uh, but I want you to become so versed in the gospel of Jesus that you realize that it does answer every question of our existence. Okay? All right. Well, we need to start with what is the gospel? Are, do we need a break? Or are you still oh, with me? Anybody need a break? We're, we're doing okay? Okay, good. Um, go to Romans 1. Because here's the thing that I, I, I'm more and more convinced of is that we have a, a very, for many of us, we have a very small view of the gospel. And I, I'm hoping that your view of the gospel gets really big today. So we'll start with Romans 1 where Paul tells us what it is and how we should consider it. Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It's interesting how many times you see the word faith in there. Uh, if you were to give the summation statement of what it means to be God's people, it would be that last statement, the righteous live by faith. It comes from our understanding of the, our fr first father of the faith, Abraham, who was a pagan worshiper, and God calls him to be his man, and through him to have a people that will be God's people, and then through that people, the seed would come, who would be the one by which all the world would be blessed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. And that phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, is the way that we're to define ourselves. It's to say, we don't put our hope in what we've done. We put our hope in who God is, what he's done, and who he said, what he said is true about us. So God calls Abraham righteous and, uh, because Abraham believed God. That was it. God says, you're my man. I'll be your God. I'll make your family huge. And through, all, through your family, I'll bless all the earth. And Abraham believes God when he doesn't have any kids. And God says, that's what's right. That, that is what righteousness is. You believed me. That was it. And God declared him righteous based on that. It's pretty amazing. So when we talk about the gospel, at the heart of the gospel, it's who God is and what he's done and us then putting our faith in that. It's believing God and believing what he says and believing that what he's done is enough. And so the way I would put this is the gospel, and I'm just using Paul's words here, the gospel, if we're going to do a summary of it, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So it's, it's the emphasis on God's power to save and his work to accomplish it through Jesus Christ, and we'll unpack that, but the summation would be it is God's power to save to all who believe. That's the summation of the gospel. Uh, but now let's unpack it because... That would not be sufficient, as we know Paul takes the rest of Romans to help us understand what he means by that. Um, in the gospel, what we see is we see a revelation of God's righteousness. And not just that God is righteous, but God's means of making us righteous. Uh, that's, that's what we see unpacked. And what you, what you get with the gospel is it's not just a rescue plan. It's not just a God bringing you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious son and the kingdom of light. It's also God saving you for a purpose. So it's you being saved by God's power for God's purpose. And has both sides to it. It's both a rescue plan and a purpose. And I'm going to talk about it in three ways this morning. Uh, one, God has saved us from something for something. Two, God is saving us from something and for something. And three, God will save us from something and for something. There's a past, present, and future reality to the gospel. God has saved us. God is saving us. God will save us. And it's important to understand that the good news of God's salvation in Christ Jesus isn't just something that happened, though it did. It's a historical event that did happen. We must get that right. But it's also happening. And it will happen. Okay, so I want to start with what happened. Romans 8, or 1, 18, let's keep reading. What is this revelation? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, it's important, brothers and sisters, for us to realize that if we don't understand that there's wrath being revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness, then there is no good news. Okay, so the, the idea of the gospel just being God is love and God loves you, which is true, but we don't have any of the God who was against you. By nature, Ephesians 2, you are children of wrath, not children of God by nature, children of wrath, born into a state where God's against you, not for you. If we don't get that, then the idea that now God is for us in Christ Jesus isn't good news that warms our heart. It just is sentiment. It's kind of pithy good news. It's not like life-changing, earth-shattering good news because we didn't realize that the God of the universe who sustains us every day has a reason to kill us in this moment. If we don't realize that, then the good news that he didn't kill us, that he didn't treat us as our sins deserve, isn't really that big of a deal. I'm reading uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' biography right now, and he, he said, our job pastors, he's speaking to pastors, our job pastors is not to convert people. That's a good word, because we don't convert, the Holy Spirit does. He said, our job is to convince them that they need to be converted. Our job is to help them realize there's a problem. Now, we don't even do that either because the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts them of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But it's our job to at least tell them there's a problem. We are sinners. We are in trouble apart from Jesus Christ. We are, we are doomed. We're doomed. If we don't get that, then the idea that we're saved doesn't mean anything. Saved from what? You know, you go like, I've been saved. Saved from what? Next time I ask somebody that, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saved from what? And if all they tell you is I'm saved from hell, then they still don't get it. You're saved from God's wrath. God was against you. Regularly I tell my kids, where some of you heard me say this before, that we're, you know, we're, they're complaining, they're fighting, they're in the car, and I'll stop and pull over the road, and I'll go, hold on, kids. You guys are complaining like you didn't get the toy you wanted or the ice cream you wanted or the seat you wanted or whatever it is. What did you deserve, kids? And they go, death. <laughs> and are you dead? No. Why? Because of God's grace. Because of God's mercy. Ephesians 2. God's mercy. You were by nature children of wrath, but God, who is rich in mercy, such good news, did not treat you as you deserve. This is good news, man. In fact, if when you talk about the good news of the gospel, it doesn't sound like good news, then you missed it. And it may be because we don't realize there was really, really bad news for those who don't understand the grace of God in Christ Jesus for them. So we have to start there. And then why, why, why is God's wrath, wrath revealed? And we're going to unpack this a little bit more later, but I'll just do a little bit here. Because what God... What, what could be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became, became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were dark and claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Why is God's wrath against them? Because the very giver and sustainer of life has been rejected in exchange for things that we make with our hands. Things that we can control. Now, not only should God be angry because you rejected the giver of life, but he should be angry because you're worshiping things that can't sustain your life. See, God's wrath and anger against us is good for us. Because he's angry that we're going to go into destruction. He loves us dearly, and he does not want us to live a life of destruction. And so God's anger is also an expression of God's deep love for his creation. And so God, who is rich in mercy, saved us from our due penalty. Many of you um, know, I hope that you realize that you and I don't have a clue what we deserved. And so when Jesus is hanging on a cross, here we have a perfect man who lived a perfectly submitted life to God in all things. In other words, 
He did the opposite of Romans 1. So we exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We went to other things to worship and depend on. And Jesus says, I can't do anything apart from God. Remember when he says that? I only do what he, he tells me to do. Uh, whatever, he see, whatever I see him do, I do. I, I, I can't do anything. This is Jesus saying, I can't do anything apart from him. And that's the life he wanted to tell us we should have lived, this life of ongoing dependency and submission and worship. And Jesus did it perfectly every single moment of every single day until he went to the cross, he did it. And when he hung on a cross, you have the perfect God-man who lived the human life that you and I were to live in our place. And I want, I want to make sure you get that. Don't, don't go past that. For many of us, we're so cross-centered, we miss the life of Christ. But if you don't get the, the perfect life of Christ, the cross doesn't work. You needed a perfect life, fully submitted to God in all things, because that's the life we were supposed to live. And it's not just a sacrifice that's atoning, it is, but it's a substitutionary atoning sacrifice, meaning the, the God-man who lived a perfect human life put himself in our place who didn't. And so when Paul says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, what he's saying is there was a great exchange. The one man who lived the perfectly submitted human life unlike Adam and the rest of us, went to the cross and said, now I will take all of their rebellion and sin and exchanging the truth of God for a lie on myself. And all of it will be removed from them and put on me. Every single sin that we've ever committed or will commit was put on Christ on that day. And in that moment, in God's economy, he exchanged our sin for Christ's righteousness. Christ got our sin, we got his righteousness. We got his perfectly submitted life in exchange for our rebellious one at the cross. And so now God, who is rich in mercy, is not just looking past our sin. Don't get that wrong. It's not as though God's looking at you and go like, okay, sin's not a big deal. I'll just accept you anyway. No, no, that's not what's going on. What God is doing is he's looking at you and he's going, I see Jesus. Now, if, if you were still your sin, if you were still defined by your sin, God couldn't do that. You need to understand that. He, he couldn't just, just go, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to leave sin unpunished. The scriptures are really clear. We do have a loving God, but he does not let sin go unpunished. He does not. So someone had to die in our place, and that's Jesus Christ. It's not as though God didn't punish for sin. It's that Jesus took the punishment for our sin. It's one who didn't deserve to be punished, received the death penalty for you and me. It's, it's one who never knew sin, tasted all of our sin, so that we could go free and become saints instead of sinners. And here's the deal. That means you and I don't need to do a thing to make ourselves right with God. We don't need to work harder. We don't have to cover up. We don't have to convince him we're serious about our sin this time. It means we don't, it's like when I blow it, we don't go like, oh, God, I'll try harder. No, that's not what you say. You say, I get it. I'm a mess. If it weren't for Jesus, I'd have no hope. And so instead of boasting in your, your repentance or somehow your, your ability to, to beat yourself up for your sin, you boast in Christ. I was with a young man this last week after the, the gathering as I preached the gospel again and and he's just trying to remind people you're loved dearly by God, not by anything you've done, but because your life is now hidden in God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, when God sees you, he sees his son. And when he sees his son, he goes, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And if your life is hidden in Christ, that's what he says to you. I'm well pleased with you. And some of us are going, I'm going to work hard. So on that day, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you don't even realize he's already said it to you. He's already said, well done, good and faithful servant, because your life is in Christ. And he's looking at Jesus, and he's seeing Jesus. And if you, you put your hope or boasting in your good works throughout this life, you think you're going to stand on that day and go, look at what I did for you, God. He's going to go, it still doesn't even come close to what Jesus did. Why would you want to boast in your works in comparison to his works? Why wouldn't you just keep boasting in his works? And so I was with this man, young man, and he, he was super depressed after the gathering. And he said, can, can we meet this week? I said, well, why don't we just talk right now? By the way, side note, when people say, will you pray for me? Don't tell them you will. 
do it. Right? Don't just go, yeah, I'll pray for you. You know, most of us never pray for people. We just tell them we'll pray for people. And, and if someone comes to you and they're deeply in need of the gospel, be an evangelist in that moment. Do the work of an evangelist. So in that moment, I'm like, okay, evangelism time. And so we sat down. And I said, what's going on? And he didn't give me the details of his struggle, but I could tell. And I could tell just by the shame and the condemnation, it was probably pornography. And, um, and then I eventually found out that was part of it. And, and, and I know that's a big struggle for a lot of young men and, and women these days. And, and he was talking about, like, just the shame and the guilt and... And I said, and I said, okay, I, I can discern that you're probably looking at stuff, aren't you? And he said, yeah. And I said, I said, so what do you do when you look at the stuff? And he's like, well, I'm like, okay, we don't, you don't have to tell me that. Just like, what I mean is, like, when afterward, and you're you're ashamed, and you're feeling terrible, and you're beating yourself up, what do you do? I mean, do you worship? I mean, do you just and in that moment you go, thank you, God, for your grace. Jesus, you died for what I just did. And he's like, what? I said, here's the deal. The longer that you wallow in your sin and self-pity and, and shame, the more that you live apart from worship of Jesus Christ. The more that you give glory to the flesh, the more that you give glory to sin, the more that you magnify the wrong God. And the very thing that got you into looking at the stuff you're looking at is the very thing that you're still doing that's keeping you full of shame, and that is you are worshiping something other than Jesus Christ. Let me just ask you, if you went to the computer and you're starting to look at something, you said, Jesus, you are amazing. I praise you for the fact that you died for what I'm about to do. What would you do? And he said, well, I wouldn't do it. I said, that's because grace is so much more compelling than sin. And the reason we don't do that is because we don't think it's true. We think it's scandalous. And for some of you, you're even going like, Come on, man. I mean, he should feel bad for a while. Let the guy wallow in his shame. And that's because you think shame is more powerful than the grace of God. And I want to encourage you, don't use the consequences of sin to help people get free of their sin. It doesn't work. The consequence of sin is the reminder that you're broken, and if you live in that place and you don't exult in the only one who isn't broken, then you'll never get free. And so... Shame is a result of sin, there's no doubt. But please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying we shouldn't experience shame. I think shame is the experience you have when you look elsewhere. It's what Adam and Eve experienced. And so what do they do? They cover themselves up. But what does God do? He doesn't come along and go, shame on you, Adam and Eve. You should be hiding. You should get more fig leaves and cover up. No, he goes, why are you hiding? Who told you you were naked? In other words, who is now informing who you are? Who is the one you're looking to? You're looking to self. You're looking to your works. You're looking to everything else to define you instead of me in this moment. And what God wants for us in those moments of brokenness is not for us to exult in our sin or to cover up with fig leaves or to wallow in pity or to beat ourselves up with whips. He's wanting us to exult in Christ because what Christ did was sufficient. You don't need to add to it. Your, your, your wallowing and your shame does n is not necessary. What he did on the cross is sufficient. It, it takes care of all of it. And so, I, as I talked to him, he's like, it, it was almost like he couldn't believe it was that the gospel's that good. Like, he really didn't believe that God's grace is sufficient in that moment that even after he did it, he could experience the grace of God because Jesus had already knew, died for it. Jesus, I told him when we were talking, I said, Hey, just so you know, Jesus wasn't surprised in what you did. He knew it when he went to the cross. He knew before he created the world that you were going to do this, and he determined beforehand, before the foundation of the world, that he would die for that particular sin that you just committed. So when he went to the cross and said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he's speaking that to you right now. Now, do you believe Jesus gets what he wants? Do you believe when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, the Father goes, nah, not this one. They're not sorry enough. They're not, God is not looking to you for your forgiveness. He's looking to Jesus for your forgiveness. He's satisfied with Christ. Are we? Do we believe it's enough? See, and if we believe that we've been saved from the penalty of sin, then even when we do sin, we know that it's already been paid for. No guilt, no shame, 
no ongoing condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Seriously, I'm asking. <laughs> Do you believe it? I hope so. Because if this isn't dealt with at the foundation of your faith, then you will spend your entire life trying to convince God you're really sorry, trying to convince God you'll do good work so he'll love you. You'll be trying to earn his favor and his love. You won't believe that when Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, I pray that you'd love them with the same love with which you love me. And you won't believe that that's true. And you'll be wondering if you really have a Father in heaven that loves you and accepts you and is for you and not against you. And, and if you don't get that, I'll just tell you that, that there's really nothing more. If you don't know the love of God, the Father for you in Christ Jesus, then you will spend your entire life trying to earn his love. Several years ago, as I was developing a, a young man that is now the guy just two weeks ago, handed the baton of the local church leadership that I planted over to. His name is Randy, a guy that I had the privilege of discipling. And I remember early on in his faith journey, he, um, he would pray regularly. And um, we'd pray together. And you can learn a lot, by the way, about what people believe about the gospel by listening to their prayer life. And so he would, he would pray, and he would, he would pray like this, Lord, God, would you just, God, would you just, and he would just say just about a hundred times. And, you know, and, and by the way, we do this a lot too. And I'm just like, like we, we, what do we, who, do we not realize that we have a good father in heaven who, who isn't just about the just? You know, like, he, wants, he wants you to ask for big things. He, he doesn't want you to be afraid to approach him. And he's a good dad. He doesn't give you a rock when you ask for, for bread. He doesn't give you a snake when you ask for fish. He loves to give good gifts to his children. I love it when my kids, the other day my kids said, Dad, you're rich, right? And I said, well, I mean, we're all rich in this country, kids. I mean, we all have way more than enough. And, and they said, yeah, but I mean, like, you're a millionaire, right? And I said, well, actually, I'm not. And, well, what do you mean? Isn't everybody a millionaire? And, like, no. And they said, well, you're rich, though. You're richer than all the other dads, aren't you? And I'm like, well, it depends on how you define that. You know, like, so they're going, so I, at one point, but here's what's happening. I love the fact that they think I've got unending wealth. Right? Because what do they do? They're like, Dad, could we have this? And can we have, and there's no limit to what they ask of me because they think I can buy them anything. Now, they're going to learn over time that, that there's only one who has that ability, and that's God the Father. And so in him, we're rich. I mean, we have, we're co-heirs with Christ. We're, we have tons of resources. Um, but what I love about that is they believe I'm wealthy and that I'm generous. And, and, and what I, when I was listening to my, my friend, Randy, pray, I was realizing he doesn't believe God's generous and gracious because he was trying to convince God with many words that he's worthy of getting his prayers answered instead of being convinced that Jesus is worthy and therefore because he's in Christ he can go to the Father just like Jesus did and ask for anything and God has unlimited resources with, with unending generosity and abundance for his children and so as we were praying I realized he, he didn't get the Father's heart now I knew enough of his story to know that as a young boy his dad left his family and had been very abusive and hurtful and so the idea of a, uh, of a father is a really hard concept for him to get one that's loving and kind and generous. And uh, so one time we were praying and I stopped and I said, hey, I just need to pause. I've been praying with you for, for several months and I, I've never heard you call God Father. And he, was, he had been, started going to seminary, so he's, you know, he's reading the books, you know, he knows Trinitary theology, you know, and Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, and so he's like, well, I know he's Father. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Do you know him as father? Well, yeah, of course I do. So, all right, well, let's, let's go back to the father in prayer. Lord God, would you just... And then he just keeps going again on this mantra, and he doesn't call God his father. I said, start by calling him your father. Okay, I'll do that. Lord God, would you... I said, he's your father. He loves you. I know. No, you don't. You don't know. I said, you, you still think you have to earn the father's affection. You still think that you have to impress him with your prayers. You still think God's a far-off deity that doesn't come near. And I said, none of that's true. 
Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God came near, and God gave his life through the Son for you. And God is for you and not against you, and God is abundantly rich in his blessing in your life, and he wants you to come to him like a little boy and just say, Dad, I need you. Show me your love. And I said, I want, he said, well, I, I believe that. I believe the gospel. I know that's what you're saying. I said, okay, well, let's go. And he tried again, and he couldn't. And I said, I said, brother, it's only the Spirit of God who can pour the love of God the Father into your hearts. That's what Romans 5, 8, 5 says. It says, it's the Spirit that pours his love into our hearts. And I said, it's my prayer that the Spirit would pour the love of the Father into your heart, and you would know God as Father who loves you and accepts you freely in Christ. And um, we had to go. I didn't have any more time. to. I had to get off to another meeting, and... I said, I'm just going to ask you to submit to the Spirit today and ask him to pour the love of the Father into your heart and make the Father's heart known to your heart. And we left, and he went into his bedroom, and he got on his knees, and he, he continued to pray. And he told me later, he said, the, it's like something changed. It's like the Spirit of God took off the blinders. The Spirit of God poured the love of the God the Father into his heart. And he said he just began to weep and just say, I love you, Father. I love you, Daddy. You love me. And he began to pray with his heart overwhelmed with the love of God the Father expressed through Jesus Christ to him. And I would say to you, as I said to him, don't go out and start doing a whole bunch of ministry if you don't have that first. Because what you'll do is you'll use people to get love. You'll only, if people reject you, you'll feel rejected. I mean, your whole life will rise and fall upon people's response to ministry that you exert to them. Instead of you being willing like Jesus to have everybody reject you and you know ultimately the Father hasn't, that you're still dearly loved. And nothing can change that. And that's what this first part is all about. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We were children of wrath by nature. Now we're children of God. Do you hear that? You're dearly loved. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not the sin you committed yesterday, not the sin you'll commit this afternoon, not what you'll do tonight in your bedroom. None of that. None of it will separate you from the love of God. His love is greater than your sin. And that's what I told that young man this last week. I said, the problem with you is you think your sin is greater than God's love. You think that your sin is greater than God's grace. And that's arrogant pride for you to think that somehow you can out God's love for you. God's love is far greater than your sin. And we know that at the cross because he paid for it and he said, it's finished. Now, I'm going to go on to the other two parts, but I want to give us a, just a moment here to uh, stop because I, I sense that we, if you don't get this, if you don't know this, if you don't believe this, it'll just be empty teaching. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to maybe have you, maybe at your tables, maybe you pair up and, um, and just ask each other, do you know the love of the Father? And, um, and maybe you'll say yes, but I want you to, whatever you say, I want you to listen well to one another, and I want you to pray for each other, and pray that the Spirit of God would pour more and more of the knowledge of the love of God into our hearts. Remember, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be open. And I pray that you'd be enlightened, that you'd see how great this love is for you. You were adopted. You were chosen. You're dearly loved children of God. So why don't we take a, a moment to do that? Just with each other. Maybe you even go like, I'm struggling. This is hard. I don't know if I believe this. Or I don't know if I've ever known it. Or, you know, because I, I, I know in this room there's plenty of you who probably had an earthly dad who didn't give you a very good picture of a heavenly one. And you need to look at Jesus as the picture of the heavenly one, not at your earthly one. And so pray for each other. Just take a few minutes. Talk a little bit about... Okay, do I know this love? Where am I struggling to believe it? And then take some time to pray with each other. And I think you should do it probably in pairs because it'll take too long if you all do it in one big group. Okay? Father, I just join with my brothers and sisters right now praying that they would know the love that you have for them as expressed in the Son. There's no greater love than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends. I think the only greater love than that is that you would lay down your life for your enemies. And so we know that you have expressed 
a love of another kind in giving your life for us. And we pray the evil one would not have his way, our flesh would not win, the world would not speak louder than the voice of the Spirit right now that says the Father loves you, the Father accepts you, the Father affirms you, the Father speaks over you, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter with whom I'm well pleased. So as we have our lives hidden in Christ, Father, we receive the love that you have for us, that you rightfully give to Jesus, but now by grace you've given to us. Help us to know it. Help us to rest in it. In Jesus' name, amen.